Today we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Welcome to Bill Myers Inspires. My idea for this show was to invite guests and get the conversation started, to take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. And we encourage our listeners to look within themselves to take decisive action to make a positive difference. Welcome to Bill Myers Inspires. I'm your host, Bill Myers. And today we have a wonderful show lined up, but today is uh, there's, there's a lot of things going on today as we um, celebrate Good Friday, as Christian folk do, uh, leading up to Resurrection Sunday. And so I think it is befitting that my guest today is an, a, a, an individual that I shared the stage with in Godspell. So I wanted to tie that all together. So it's it's not just random. It, it makes sense. So uh, today, our topic is on anti-Asian hate crimes, which have been on the rise in this nation for quite some time now. Um, if you recall, back in October, uh, actually October the 16th, I had on the show um, Christine Toy Johnson, and we were talking about, at that time, the um, sort of emergence of Asian hate crimes in America. And certainly since October the 16th, things have increased, one would say exponentially. So uh, I want to have an opportunity to redress this topic because it is, it is uh, taking the headlines of our newsfeed today. And it is something very, very important that I think we should get a handle on as we are here and prone to, to address issues like racism and all of that nasty stuff. So again, anti-Asian hate crimes, America versus humanity with my guest today, Mia Korf. Anti-Asian hate crimes are continuing to grow in America. Are these hate crimes the same as racism when perpetrated against blacks in America? I just think it's very interesting that when we refer to certain groups, um, we, we use different language, but I think at the end of the day, we're at the same place. Is America in a battle with its own diversity and its citizens of color? When will America embrace humanity over hatred, division, and oppression? My guest today is um, an actress, and she's a mama, and she's an entrepreneur, and She's a lots of things. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Mia Korf's escapades as a performer crisscrossed the country in the worlds of Broadway, off-Broadway, regional theater, television, film, commercials, voiceovers, and the Los Angeles live music scene. Mia started out in life as a classical violinist. She had her first lesson before her third birthday and was mentored by uh, Hamo. Fujiwara, okay, pardon me if I butcher that, um, of the Juilliard School before attending Cornell University. Mia is also a certified mediator and an accredited Suzuki violin teacher. I didn't know that. Mia recently returned to her hometown of Ithaca, New York, to help care for her mom and spend time with her daughter, who is at Cornell in the class of 2023. She has spent the last few months settling into her 1928 craftsman home and creating jewelry for her Etsy shop uh, entitled Via Mia Designs. She's thrilled to reconnect with Bill Myers, who is that, and contribute to this conversation of inspiration. So um, before we go much further, I, I have to introduce my good friend, Mia Korf, but I want to do that in the appropriate fashion. So just hold on a second. We got theme music for Mia. Uh oh. <laughs> Prepare ye the way of the Lord. 
Lord. <laughs> Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Please help me welcome my special guest, Mia Korf. Mia! Hello, Bill. Thanks for having me on your podcast. You're the first to have theme music. You do realize that. I am so honored. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good times, huh? Yeah, good. absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I thought with Holy Week, and I thought certainly with copyrights, they wouldn't bother me because he's singing a cappella, and it is biblical, you know. So, um, uh, so welcome to the show today, and I, I want to, uh, again, sort of back into this, this topic and sort of get your initial thoughts on where we are with this uh, crazy anti-Asian racism stuff going on in the country. I just want to hear from your, your heart right now. Well, thanks, and um, I'm sure I'm going to repeat some of the stuff you talked about with Christine, uh, who I worked with years ago, I adore her. Um, on the one hand, it's so shocking to me what's going on. On the other hand, I don't think I ever thought I would see people brazenly with Nazi flags. I don't think I ever could have imagined in my wildest dream that we would have to see footage of George Floyd. You know, I mean, I, so a part of me is absolutely shocked and a part of me is not. But when I look at the, um, the things that I think are contributing, mm -hmm. it's, really, it's really sad to me. Um, I mean, on the one hand, obviously we've had leadership, we've had, you know, media figures just spewing absolutely poisonous rhetoric, mm -hmm. right? And <clears throat> with the pandemic at the forefront of this discourse and leadership calling, mis, you know, naming this virus as the Kung Flu and the China virus, basically giving people permission to let their racist freak flags fly. Right. Uh, I mean, that's just the start. I think another facet that I come to is um, the recent movement with Black Lives Matter, even the most bigoted people kind of know now, oh yeah, it's not cool to you know be openly racist against BIPOC people, right? Right, right. And in a way, I wonder if just that energy, that hatred, that whatever it is that spurs people on to have that kind of negativity, I wonder if it's now just pivoted conveniently um, to another group of people to blame for your troubles. Um, and I say convenient also, Bill, because we don't have to reach that far back in history. Right. To Vietnam, before that, the Korean War, before that, World War II. Um, if you look at the last 80 years, for 40 of those years, Yellow Man was the enemy. Like literally, you're killing, right? At war. So it's this sort of, I hate to use this phrase because it's not perfect, but perfect storm. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of it, I, I have to mention this uptick in, and I don't know if you guys covered this with Christine, but the majority of these crimes are happening, almost 70% of them that have been reported, and I'll get back to that in a second, because those statistics are to be, to be really looked at. Right. 70, almost 70% 70 are specifically against Asian women. Mm. So get into the conversation of intersectionality with racism and sexism, because they can't really be parsed out. There right. are long history of objectifying Asian women, uh, perceiving them as being more docile or you know, become seen as easier targets perhaps. Um, but also there are a fair amount of women who are working in the, in the sex industry, et cetera. But um, you know, that, that conversation, we could spend a whole podcast on just that. Right. Reality. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to see that we now have leadership that is addressing this full on. I mean, Biden came out and strongly um, saying that these are the things that he wants to do. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot of resources for people now who are wondering, like, what can I do to help? 
right? Right. Uh, but as far as my own personal feelings, it's it's really like I said, it's 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 so shocking for me to think about. You know, when I grew up in upstate New York, when you know, we were the only real Asian family around, and of course, I absorbed a certain amount of just you know racism that kids. I don't know. I guess you. I guess you learn it, right? I guess you learn it in the home, but. Like my sister was saying today, every day she got on the bus was, oh, the Chini Chong girl, you know, it's every day, every day something. I remember even though when we were working on God's Spell together, right. in, every time I get on the subway, I subconsciously would feel myself kind of tighten up and sort of like get ready for some kind of comment, right? It was just a part of life. Um, I don't know which way to go right now because there's so many different things, topics I could talk about. No, no, no. That's, you know, no, that's interesting because uh, no, that, and that's good. I, I just wanted to kind of let you sort of wander where you needed to go before we, we get into some specifics, because that was where I wanted to go next was to talk about your, um, your own heritage, your own experience as a youngster growing up uh -huh. um i wanted to address and and take a look at that so tell us about that i mean you were you were leading on to uh, some of the comments on the bus and that sort of thing but you know tell us about your um your family your you grew up in ithaca uh as a yeah. youngster so um what is your family first second generation in america i mean i just kind of want to get a a picture of, of that experience my mom was raised in uh japan Okay. my dad when he was over there teaching and then married him at a very young age and then came to the states and had four kids mm -hmm. and in some ways we had a very typical american upbringing in other ways not so much i mean my mother's not a very typical japanese woman the very fact that she left japan in her early 20s and ran off with a you know tall american guy right there you know uh set her apart a little bit um right. but it wasn't cool growing up being half Asian. There just weren't any others of us around. Yeah. So, you know, you always felt other. You were always meant to, and it probably didn't help that I ticked a lot of the stereotypical boxes. You know, I was studious, I played the violin, had a long stringy hair. <laughs> you know, I was sort of, <laughs> um, <laughs> I was voted most likely to succeed. You know, hilarious, but, um, it was it wasn't cool, you know, and it wasn't until I got into acting into theater late into high school that a whole other world opens up to me of, oh, people can see me for something other than just that. And um, they can see that I have this skill set or that skill set. And, you know, it was a uh, it was a it was an important time for me. Um, going through that. Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of, there are a lot of very interesting parallels in that, you know, in the mixed race scenario, okay. uh, because very similar scenario um, for me. I mean, my mom is white, grew up in, you know, she was from Arkansas, you know, very much sort of redneck and, and sort of background, uh, racist background, I'm family and and my father being black and uh, police officer in Indianapolis. I mean, so, but growing up, as you say, I mean, we were oftentimes the only mixed kids, biracial kids in a, an entire school. So you're, you're looking to the left and right. And it's like, I, I don't really know where I suppose I fit in. And that other box was the box. Um, that was the only option at, at that particular time. Um, but uh yeah, it, there, there's an odd duck scenario. And again, music I found early on as you, as you did, but then it was the theater, I think was a big turn yeah. because you got a chance to express yourself and come out and say things because I don't think that I was, I could articulate very well early on. So music was my voice box because yeah. I didn't really know what the right thing to say or the wrong thing to say was. So, I mean, I, I you know, I just sort of kept to myself. So I, I totally, totally get that. Um, and uh, so there, so we have very much common ground on, on many of these issues. And I got a feeling we'll, we'll discover more and more as the conversation. Yeah. Uh, I, 
you know, as I got a little older, I was thinking about you the other day, Bill, because we do have an awful lot of crossover. Um, you know, when I went off to college and then I, I left and, and went to New York, um, you know, you and I tumbled onto the entertainment scene around the same time, you know, late 80s, early 90s. Right, right. During a time when this non-traditional casting thing was all anybody could talk about in the casting circles, right? Right, right. And we both benefited, benefited and we both had things that we had to straddle. I want to make sure you tell your story about The Wiz. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, but it was interesting because on the one hand, oops, I better turn off this. I'm so sorry. I'm getting ticked about my family. Um, <laughs> You know, I had a lot of opportunities I would not normally have had, I think. Um, one of my first really big jobs was uh, Shakespeare in the Park. And I was uh, in New York understudying Barbara Rush, who is <laughs> about five feet tall, blonde. Um, it, was, it, was, it was hilarious. It's a good thing I never had to go on. I never clothes or anything would have fit me. I was horrible. <laughs> but, um, you know, there was a lot of situations like that I found myself in where, oh, well, okay. So this, this whole idea of not quite colorblind casting, but non-traditional casting. Right, right. I mean, who knows even if God's will would have happened? Who, who, who knows? Who can say? Right. Who can say? Right. And then um, a few years later, right after God's will, actually um, accepting a contract role on One Life to Live, at that time... There weren't any Asians on daytime, except for a few who spoke with an accent. So I took this as, wow, well, politically speaking, I've got to take this job. I, you know, I've got to represent. Right. The irony was there was no mention whatsoever. It was so colorblind and it was so non-traditional that there was no mention of my race. I was just Dorian's niece. So um, in retrospect, what a missed opportunity. It would have been a fantastic time to explore some of those issues. But, yeah. you know, so traditionally a little more conservative further back, you right, know, sure. we weren't ready to have, I don't think, a fully integrated Asian American character maybe on that show. Although we had the first gay character in daytime, it was a very young Ryan Philippi. That was actually more ahead of the curve than, you know, addressing my ethnicity. And uh, to wit, when I left the show, my character, I was replaced by a tall blonde Texan playing the same role. The role of Blair Dane Buchanan is now played by the tall Wow. Blonde. That you know that it, that's so interesting. Well, we're gonna we're gonna take a break real quick and and uh, we'll be back in just a minute. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires right here on the Inspired Choices Network. And today we are discussion, discussing anti-Asian hate crimes with my guest, Mia Korf. We'll be back in just a moment. Today, we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Bill Myers Inspires, as he and his guests take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. Emmy Award-winning actor Bill Myers is an accomplished actor, jazz musician, filmmaker, writer, educator, and speaker. As a biracial man who's both black and white, Bill leverages his background, talent, and voice through creativity, compassion, and connection as activism for social justice to focus on uniting the divide and compelling change. Bill Myers Inspires encourages listeners to look within themselves and take decisive action to make a positive difference. For more information, visit his website, BillMyersInspires.com, and sign in for the latest news and updates. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspire Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. 
professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world, knowing your voice matters, and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspired Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires here on the Inspired Choices Network. We're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's get back to the conversation. We're back. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires, and today we're discussing anti-Asian hate crimes uh, in America, and it's America versus humanity. And with my guest, Mia Korf. Mia, I've got some some stuff I want to share with you before we continue this here conversation. And it is, um, this is an article that I pulled up uh, uh, that was written by Kimmy uh, Yam on March 9th, 2021. The headline is anti-Asian hate crimes increased by nearly 150% in 2020, mostly in New York and LA reports say. And so what this is suggesting is, and it, it further goes on to say, uh, analysis released by the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at Cal State University, San Bernardino, this month examined hate crimes in 16 of America's largest cities. It revealed that while such crimes in 2020 decreased overall by 7%, those targeting Asian people rose by nearly 100 and 50 yeah. percent. And um, and I suppose that contributes to the uh, post on Facebook that Christine Toy Johnson put up just a couple of days ago, which says we should not have to be afraid to walk down the street because someone might attack us from behind, push us to the ground and kick us in the head a few times while security guards watch and then close the door. I don't even know what to think anymore. Yeah, so those statistics are really um, frightening, sobering. Yeah. Especially this, you know, overall hate crimes had gone down 7% because of COVID, because of the pandemic. People are not- That's exactly out. it, exactly. They're, they're not even out in the world. And yet for AAPI folks up 150%, the other thing, I don't know if she's mentioned that later in the article, but only like there's a third of crimes that don't get reported. There's a, I want to say cultural barrier for reporting for a lot of Asian people. Um, it's not comfortable for them to speak out or they fear repercussions from the police where there's language barriers. Um, also, you know, just the difference in cultural, culturally maybe not wanting to make a, a big fuss so it's up 149%, 150% that we know of, that we can document. But yeah. there's many undocumented cases that how do we really get purchase on what that number really is? Yeah, you know, and I, I want to expand on that because I, I want to draw some, some other um, uh, parallels. Uh, just as you say, uh, you know, the number of cases with regards to Asian, anti-Asian hate crimes or not reported, I would expand on that and, and, and show you this whole sort of similarity is people of color wouldn't, that thing would be true of black people, Latino people, you know, Asian people. Also in that same minority group, let's put women in there as well. So now we're talking about the unreported, large report, unreported rapes, uh, of offenses toward women. So similarly, you, you've got the same level of silence of people who don't want to deal with authorities because they don't necessarily see that uh, uh, as, as a relief to the issue. In fact, it could invite more problems uh, into their lives. So I find that to be very, very interesting um, that there is that same parallel. And that's not to, to by any means... Uh, 
uh, uh, dilute the power of what you're saying. It's just I want to to put it in a, in a context. I've been talking about racism since I started this show. And so once I start to see the statistics here, the statistics here, you start going, you know, un unless you're a white male, we're all in a boat of second class citizenry in some sort of way. And the white male is still running the show. And you, you see what I mean? So the threat is still very much present. Um, and I'm glad to see the, the activities um, and, and the fact that we can have conversations like this, um, which, as you mentioned, you know, back in the late 80s and some of the other times, I don't know, I, I would probably not be uh, able to say many of these things. And, and a lot of people wouldn't, quite frankly, um, because we were in another stage of denial. So you had asked me to, to speak to uh, my experience uh, in the late 80s, 90s of um, this um, uh, non-traditional <laughs> casting issue. So I was in the thick of that uh, with regards to Actors, Actors Equity Association, which is the professional theater actors union. And so I was um, pretty active in that. And when, when all of that non-traditional stuff came out, like the first time, let's try this, let's try this. And as it turned out, the very first case in the nation of the non-traditional casting scenario was a production of The Wiz in Chicago. And the um, production cast the Dorothy as a white young lady. And that upset lots and lots of people because they were like, oh, they cried foul on this. And I had to stand in that space of saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. It doesn't just me just apply to black people, Latino people, Asia, whatever. No, no, no. That is across the board. So they have exercised non-traditional casting. They took a black musical and cast a white girl in the lead role. So, you know, you have to um, you have to accept that. And that wasn't a very popular thing to say. And I, I realized that it was, you know. So I was on a whole lot of people's list and probably called a whole lot of names. And, and I would have been calling myself the same names too, because I understood what was, what it was, but you can't have, uh, you can't have it one way only, you know, if you're going to go down that path, you really have to look out for the, the broadest application of, of, of that, you know, so, but anyway, be that as it may. So, so I want to um, continue to talk about, what do you see in, in your experience or, or experience of those that you might know, loved ones or what have you in recent times? Any encounters or any looks or any strange things? Because this whole being out, uh, the, the racists are out. I mean, they are out. That, that The whole Trump thing sort of brought, all of them have surfaced. And, and oddly enough, some of them were people that, you know, I, I grew up with and thought we were cool. And I thought, man, if you ever held thoughts like that or, or spoke them loud, aloud, then there's no way we would ever be friends. So it makes me really question that they were just guarded and, but they were racist all along. I don't think you, you get jumped into that game. I think you are, or you aren't. Um, and yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> and that, you know, that, that starts with education. I don't think anybody's born racist. I don't think anybody's born hating. You right. Know? get fed and what you learn through your family culture, what have you. Uh, exactly, have you. exactly. Um, well, it's funny you should ask, you know, I'm at the very beginning of the pandemic, living pretty happily in Los Angeles and um, Trump made a speech, I wanna say it was on March the 11th. Mm. And my boyfriend went, oh no. And his spidey senses started tingling. We had a family meeting with myself and him and his daughter. And he just, I don't know, he knew, he knew it was going to happen. And we made the decision that we were going to escape from LA. Now, it didn't hurt that I had, in what I thought was a very premature move, purchased a home here in Ithaca, in upstate New York. And uh, we weren't planning to come here until August or something. But um, we decided to just pick up and go. Uh -huh. and, um, 
So we were on the road. So two days after we left LA, LA shut down. Two days after we arrived wow. in New York, New York shut down. And wow. since, since then, I feel like I've been in this sort of this bubble here, you know, I haven't been out in the world experiencing personally, you know, people making racist attacks against me. Uh, I have friends in New York, a little different. But, you know, the thing about this living here, it's a very woke town. It's a very, you know, we have Cornell University here. We have this history of amazing thinkers from, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg to Dr. Anthony Fauci, Tony Morris, you know, Right. Well, nigh Carl Sagan. We have these, you know, this culture here is very educated and very forward thinking. I have to tell you this, Bill, because you'll find this interesting. Our mayor is a young black man mm -hmm. who joined the city council when he was 20, when he was still in college, and he became mayor at 24. He's half black. He's formerly homeless. And this man, wow. he's not perfect, okay? But a community that would elect him, and now we are seeing he is being featured in uh, Pod Save America, NPR, GQ. He's coming out with really radical ideas, uh, maybe some of the most radical, taking the most radical steps to reform policing. Yeah. To reimagine public safety. So there's a way in which where I, you know, you ask the question, have I experienced it myself recently or my family? Not so much. I'm in the, you know, of course in there's the bubble. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Um, but whenever I turn on the news, whenever I read articles, I it's like I'm triggered all over again. There's so much early, you know, childhood and early adulthood experiences I had that it's not hard for me to just imagine, you know, if I was living in New York right now or back in LA, what what might what might be going on? Yeah, you know, I want to I want to talk about that. We're going to take another break real quick, but uh, I want to to peel into that a, a little deeper here in just a second. You are listening to Bill Myers Inspires, and I'm here with my guest Mia Korf. She doesn't have her base with her today, but next time for sure. Uh, today we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Bill Myers Inspires as he and his guests take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. Emmy Award-winning actor Bill Myers is an accomplished actor, jazz musician, filmmaker, writer, educator, and speaker. As a biracial man who's both black and white, Bill leverages his background, talent, and voice through creativity, compassion, and connection as activism for social justice to focus on uniting the divide and compelling change. Bill Myers Inspires encourages listeners to look within themselves and take decisive action to make a positive difference. For more information, visit his website, BillMyersInspires.com, and sign in for the latest news and updates. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires. Here on the Inspired Choices Network. We're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's get back to the conversation. We're back. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires, and I'm here with my special guest, Miss Mia Korf. She is special. She is special. She is special. So I, I said I was going to bring you on here and I, I shared with our, our castmates on our little messenger thing. Yeah. And I hope they're here with us. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys. Um, that I was going to to that's my undying love for you. So <laughs> I'm professing my undying love for you, Mia. So now that I've done that, I did. I did. Um, <clears throat> I want to. Uh, you were talking about how your recall how you uh, have not 
experienced uh, anything in our recent history because of the COVID and and living into living in Ithaca and in in a in a relatively I don't want to say safe environment I, I don't know what you call it but but certainly not the epicenter of Los Angeles and New York City proper where this stuff is really really uh, going down really really nasty stuff but you you mentioned that as you look at the news how could easily trigger and and it's right there again and the word for that is trauma the word for that is trauma and i i don't think that seems to be something that i encounter over and over again as i keep inviting these conversations about racism and all these different looks at that um, um it is the trauma uh the social trauma of these experiences that's why it feels like it's just to glance at it all of a sudden you're you're right in it i mean boy you you remember you remember because those things are seared into our experience i know that even just at this time what's going on here with regards to the george floyd trial is the worst trauma in the world because you're looking at this thing over and over again from different camera angles and body camera angles and you're literally watching a man being killed over and over i thought rodney king and, and seeing him get hit 80 some times with with kicks and, and and sticks and whatnot was bad this is truly awful i was uh helping a friend put in a floor uh, a, a, a vinyl floor or something and it was on in the other room and just to hear all of the gasping for air and the i can't breathe and please sir and you know and reaching out for your mama and all of that it is just like the worst yeah <laughs> I, I i don't know um yeah where does that where does that where does the hatred come from? You know, where do oh, I be reminded of a that's a big question period that I had while we were doing Godspell? Talk about something that steered into my memory. I was on the subway and I had a long, I had a long ride. I was on the A train. I was living up in the uh, near the cloisters at the time, so that age would take forever. But a guy came on the subway car. Might have been homeless, might have been a vet, looked very bedraggled. Mm -hmm. He was staring at me, and I was very, very, very uncomfortable. At some point, he just started unloading a litany of Asian hate. Just every every horrible thing you can imagine, just like came out like vomit. It was and everybody in the car was staring at me, and I was frozen. I'm sure my face just turned bright red. I, there was no place to go. Mm -hmm. And then the train stopped. And then as if a light switch went off, he looked down, he looked back up at me and he looked like he was going to start crying. He said, sorry, I hate torn up every time I hear about, think about this. He looked at me and he just said, I'm so sorry. And in that moment, I understood we all have trauma, right? Who knows what trauma he had? Right. And, That's important. you know, love thy neighbor, forgive thy neighbor. Um, it, it's it's hard to walk that walk sometimes, you know, when, when someone's coming at you with that kind of stuff. But where does it come from? What happened to that person to make them like that? To, to look at me and unleash his hate like that. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, it is so triggering, like you said, hearing, reliving those moments. Um, and I don't know, I mean, what, what do you think, though? What do you think is the, the answer to being ruthless and encouraging people to just let go of, of whatever false narrative they have against a person's color? What they look like? What does that have to anything to do? What, it, I mean, it just baffles, baffles. Well, I think, I don't know. I think that there are an attachment to, that it's attached to ego in a lot of ways. It's attached to insecurity. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. More than anything else. Uh, because um, when you're insecure, you can very easily feel threatened by another. N- not because they pose a threat, but just because you're that insecure that you view anything outside of yourself and that which looks like me, thinks like me, lives on the block with me, goes to the school with me, whatever that is, um, anything outside of that uh, we're afraid of. And that fear thing, we got fight or flight. You know what I mean? We've got these choices. And I think that fight business and and our ability to sort of uh, go over the top and assert ourselves, bully, intimidate, becomes a a, a viable option. And it's really unfortunate because all of these things are in direct contrast to love thy neighbor and to be able to look at one another and introduce yourself as a brother or sister kindred spirits where there's only one race this is at the end of the day we can we can talk have conversations on racism we're talking about colors and cultures and tribes that's all we're talking about because there's only one race and that's a human race and i and i really wish that we could get back to that that's why in the topic of uh you know in the title of the show i put america versus humanity because at the end of the day if America or America's mindset or that colonialism thing, that dominance thing, which is driven by an, a need, right? A need to assert and a need to, to lord over and intimidate. Again, the bully, the braggadocious, whatever. Because clearly, um, I, I don't think that there's any question uh, scientifically, uh, archaeologically or anything else that people of color have been the dominant on the planet earth (laughs) since the beginning of time. It was not, (laughs) and maybe just that fact alone is I'm outnumbered, I'm outgunned. So we must come up with a scheme or a strategy by which to intimidate and start pushing and oppressing other people that don't look like us. And we must create narratives that make us the hero in every thing. It's always bothered me being an American, the, the, the rhetoric of America, that we're the greatest, we're the biggest, we're the baddest, you know, civilization in the history of the world. And it's like, how can you say that when you're about, you know, less than 250 years old, yeah. and you're looking at cultures like whether it be Japan, China, India, you're looking at Africa, you're looking at (laughs) cultures of thousands of years and you stand in front of these. I don't, I don't have to be the baddest. You know what I mean? But at some point, if I'm number one, that automatically implies that you're number two, three, four, or something less than that. Mm -hmm. That has always bothered me because I, I don't feel that it makes no sense other than we have the the bigger bomb or something. I mean, you know, that level of an intimidation, but outside of that, uh, it's not true. Uh, It's just not true. We're the babies on the block. As far as nations go, we are, we really are a young nation. And so it's never made a lot to me that we can, we always posture as we're the superhero, you know, I, I, where does that, where does that come from? I mean, uh, I don't feel that way. I've, I'm eager to learn about other cultures and, and uh, other people and eat what somebody else eats and, you know, sleep where they sleep. I don't want to be in the tourist area. I want to go, I want to go home with you, man. I want to check out how life is, you know, how you're living, not how McDonald's is, you know, you know, in the, you know, I go across the you know globe just to go to McDonald's. It's like, shit, what a waste. I mean, I mean, you know what I mean? What a wasted opportunity to get to, no, my neighbor, what a wasted opportunity to be able to break bread together. I I don't know. Well, I wish everybody had that attitude. I mean, that would be amazing. Yeah. I I just think that, uh, but, but when you ask what that, that cause is, I think it's something, something small within us that, that yearns to be, that is something that is threatened. Uh, I really do believe that. 
Um, because what I don't know, I don't care to know. And it's like, well, boy, but if we would just take that next step and seek to know, and, you know, I always loved that uh, Abraham Lincoln qu quote about, you know, well, this guy's, you know, I really dislike this guy and, but I, I need to, I need to get to know him better. Mm. Mm. So that's not running away from the thing I don't like. That's leaning into it and saying right, well, I need to understand more about me, about what that's all about, and um, and find something likable. You know, when we're playing characters, we can't play characters we don't like. We we've got to be in love with them, even though they're rapists, they're killers, whatever their little nasty world is. We got to love on that. And and uh, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. That we have to find something, something. Yeah you know that we can hold on to so well it's time for another break and and this is this is awesome and and you just you just flipped this around so this will be the, this is the mia show because you just put me out there and said why is that bill i'm like ah, i don't know well, listen you're <laughs> a, i know you have a lot to say and i i really enjoy hearing you talk so that was important to me no I, 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 i'm not busting you i loved it actually it was like okay I, I got this. Right. Go back. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to step out for a break real quick. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires, and I'm here with my special guest, Mia Korf, and we're discussing Asian hate crimes in America, America versus humanity. And we'll be right back in just a moment. Today, we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Bill Myers Inspires as he and his guests take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. Emmy Award-winning actor Bill Myers is an accomplished actor, jazz musician, filmmaker, writer, educator, and speaker. As a biracial man who's both black and white, Bill leverages his background, talent, and voice through creativity, compassion, and connection as activism for social justice to focus on uniting the divide and compelling change. Bill Myers Inspires encourages listeners to look within themselves and take decisive action to make a positive difference. For more information, visit his website, BillMyersInspires.com, and sign in for the latest news and updates. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires. Here on the Inspired Choices Network. We're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's get back to the conversation. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires. I'm your host, Bill Myers, with my special guest, Mia Korf. Okay, Mia, I got something for you. Uh-huh, bring it. It's just my curiosity, my big-time curiosity, and it is. Are you ready for this? It is. What was your favorite line in Godspell. Oh my goodness. Oh, Bill, I don't know. How do you choose it? I have no idea. I I I I I have to get back to you on that one. I don't I, have to and that's okay. That's do you, okay. do you have a favorite line? I do. What was I it? Do. It would wake me up in the middle of the, you know, sort of the rinse and repeat process. Sometimes, you know, you're sitting there thinking about, oh, when am I going to get my laundry done this week? You know, what I mean? all the stuff that's going on mentally sometimes while you're in the midst of a scene or a performance or whatever. But there was one line that just grabbed me every night, every night, and just was that grab you by the collar or wake you up and I'm, I'm back. I'm here because it just was so very, very powerful. And the line was... For as long as you are green, brother, you will grow. And I asked about that line because I was doing some little biblical research and looking all over the place. And 
I could not find it. And so I reached out to Don Scardino, our director, and I sent him a note and I said, Don, where did that come from? And he's, he mentioned that somebody, I don't know if it was a cast member or something, but somebody added that in and it stuck. And wow. that was the favorite line of that entire show because I could not find it because I wanted to really, and, and Don said, no, somebody added that in and, um, and it stuck. It, it just made its way into the text as a keeper. But that one line for as long as you, because it's something about that, even in the question that you posed just a moment ago, you know, um, I'm not afraid to say, I don't know, because that, that's kind of a good thing. Um, but uh, I don't ever want to uh, be so full of myself that I don't have an opportunity to grow, that I, I would rather back up sometimes, even when I think I know, to not position myself to know too much, to back up and allow someone space because there's something for me to learn in that that I did not agree. Know. You're still green, brother. Yeah, for as long as you're green. Because you think about the other and, and, and to know it all is to be ripe and to be ripe is to be dead. Things that are ripe are dead. Yeah. A lot of stuff to think about there. But that was the, that was the line. That was the line, wow, that's great, wow. Like a lightning bolt, you know, boom, you know, there it is. And I'm back and I'm here and I'm <laughs> having a conversation with Jesus, the clown and <laughs> all that. But that was a wonderful experience. I still have my, my, um, uh, uh, my Lao Tzu book that Don Scardino gave me because I wasn't there when you guys started because you mentioned being the uh, 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 understudy at, at uh, the New York Shakespeare Festival and I was the understudy originally for Godspell. And I still remember that day that I was called to uh, actually come in and do the show. And that was terrifying because I'd been under contract for a week, but I had not really been there, but maybe once or twice because I was shooting a film at the time with Trini called American Blue Note. And so, you know, it was, uh, I think Amanda or somebody said, Hey, um, but you've been under contract for a week. So officially you can, you got to come oh, in. That was terrifying. A week. You went on after a week. <laughs> I was like, I think Bill rolled. I think I was, Jeff was sick. And I think Bill rolled and did Jesus. And then I stepped into Bill Damascus and did, uh, all, uh, all, all good things. And, uh, that was a song I auditioned with. So I was familiar with that one. Well, that show would be like doing a two hour aerobic session every show. I mean, it was so athletic. We never stopped. Yeah, it was nonstop. So, so I think there's, so, so now I've got, I've got about 30 seconds or so I want, and I want to give it to you right now. So in the midst of this, this idea of all this anti-Asian activity going on what what would be your thought that you would like to leave with what is your statement you would like to leave with and you got about 30 seconds okay um first of all I, I really wish I had time to go back and sort of talk about I had said earlier that it was convenient to pivot the hate towards Asian people I think what I also meant was that it was familiar because we don't have to reach that far back right to when it, a time when you know we were just hating on Asian people a lot. But the thing I think I'd really like to end with, um, not dissimilarly, I think a lot of people will wonder, well, what can I do to help? What can I do to be proactive with the Black Lives Matter? It's not dissimilar. I mean, I think that people can donate their time or their energy. You know, there's tons of sites online where you can do that. Um, I think it's really important to speak up um, and, then maybe even take the next step if you're comfortable to, to, to reporting when you see anti-Asian hate crimes. Um, that is part of being an ally is, you know, basically stepping in front of, you know, if you see something happening, don't, don't just listen to it. Say something, you know. Say Keep something, that. do something, show up, be present. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mia, um, this has been fantastic, my dear. I've got to get out of here, but, you know, we'll be back. We'll be back again. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you for spending your afternoon right here with us at Bill Myers Inspires. 
Remember, we're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Inspired Choices Network. Remember to take time this week to take a breath and look within yourself and figure out how you can make a positive difference in this world. Spread the word, and we'll see you here next Friday. Have a wonderful week.